Welcome back students to our Chemistry 1510 video notes. In this video, let's talk about atoms and molecules. So one of the things that we're going to talk about is something called the atomic theory of matter. And this is Dalton's um, original theory. And it's really impressive how, um, how it has stood the test of time. So let's look at these four elements and determine if we think these um, statements are still true today. So first, uh, elements are composed of tiny, indivisible particles known as atoms. Well, if you know anything about nuclear chemistry, then you know that these particles are now divisible, right? We can um, collide things together and end up uh, having just a proton uh, come off, or we can generate just a... Um, beam of electrons and this would be part of the classification of nuclear chemistry and so now number one is no longer true because we can divide atoms. So number two, all atoms of an element are identical and have the same properties. This one makes sense except for the fact that um, since Dalton's time we've figured out about isotopes. So isotopes are um, elements that have the same number of protons but they differ in their number of neutrons. So in that case, they are not identical anymore because they have differing number of neutrons. So this one is also false. Number three, atoms of different elements combine to form compounds in small whole number ratios. This one is true. So if we imagine something like water, water is always going to be a chemical that has uh, two H's to one O, right? So the small whole number ratios are those um, subscripts there. And then finally, atoms are not created, destroyed, or broken into smaller pieces by a chemical reaction. Notice how chemical is underlined here. What we're talking about is things that are not nuclear chemistry. So this one is also still true, as is number three, um, as long as we're in the context of a typical chemical reaction that is not talking about, um, you know, uh, things like atom creation, right, in a, uh, in a collider or something like this. So let's look a little bit at um, the elements on the periodic table. So we've got a whole bunch of elements that naturally exist, and the rest have been made in labs. And when we look at the periodic table, you're going to notice that the majority of them have a chemical symbol. And that symbol can sometimes just have one letter. So examples would be something like hydrogen is just one letter, something like carbon is just one letter, oxygen's one letter, fluorine's one letter, nitrogen is one letter, and so those are some examples of ones that are only going to have a single letter. But what you'll start to notice is that's really not enough because there is a lot of elements that start with a C, uh, like chromium and chlorine and whatever else, and C has already been taken over here by carbon. And so we will add an additional letter to help distinguish. So chromium is Cr, copper is Cu, cobalt is Co, uh, chlorine is Cl, cadmium is Cd, let's see, what am I missing? Calcium, Ca, and cesium, Cs. So that second letter you need to make sure is lowercase. If it's not lowercase, then you're not actually talking about the element on the periodic table anymore. And then also some of the other elements, you're going to see some maybe unusual symbols for them. For example, lead doesn't have a L, an E, an A, or a D in its symbol. Instead, its symbol is PB. And so the ones that don't seem logical are because that they, their symbol is derived from the original Latin name of that element. And you think, why Latin? Well, because some of these elements that were discovered first were discovered so long ago that that was typical. So let's end this section with a little question. What is the difference between C lowercase o, 
and C uppercase O. Well, we already said up here that C uppercase O is an element. It's cobalt. Whereas C uppercase O is two elements. Those two elements are sitting right next to one another, which means they're together in a compound. And that compound, we will learn how to name uh, pretty darn soon, and that is going to be called carbon monoxide. So it's important to have some of these element symbols mentally on hand so that we can do things quickly and efficiently. So there's going to be a periodic table on Desire to Learn that will tell you which elements you need to know the names for. So what it'll look like is it'll be a periodic table where some of the boxes are highlighted in green and the symbols will be in those highlighted green boxes. And those ones are going to be the ones that you should be able to know the name and the symbol of interchangeably because they're going to be the ones that we use during chemical nomenclature, which is chapter three uh, most often. And it'll make you um, be faster and feel more confident. And uh, that's really important when it comes to exam time, right? You need to know what the elements are that you're working with or else you're going to really struggle. So let's look at some more ideas that came from Dalton's atomic theory. So let's start with the law of conservation of mass because this one people tend to know best. So in the law of conservation of mass, matter is not created or destroyed. And this is, again, in a normal chemical reaction. Oops, here we go. Oh, our abbreviation for reaction is RXN, in case you haven't seen that before. So an example of this would be if you took, um, Let's do a piece of wood. So if you took a log, here's my fancy log. Let me draw some wood grain on there, make it look real serious. Okay, and you took that wood and you took the mass beforehand and then you lit a fire underneath it. Uh, well, I guess you lit the log on fire and you burnt it. You would have to collect all the ash that would come from the log and then all of the carbon dioxide and water gases that would come from the burning process. And so if you collected the mass of the reactants and the mass of the products, they would be equal. So again, here the reactants in our example would be the log of wood. The products would be any ash or soot and then carbon dioxide and water. So let's look at the next one, the law of definite proportions. Sometimes people call this one the law of constant composition as well. So in this one, a pure compound, no matter the source, will always contain a definite or constant proportion of elements by mass. So, so, a pure compound no matter the source will always have a definite or constant proportion of elements by mass. So let's go back to our water example. So if we look at water, H2O, no matter if we are taking a sample of water from your tap or from a lake, 
as long as that water is pure, every person's sample will end up with a two gram of hydrogen to 16 gram of oxygen ratio, which of course reduces to one to eight. So no matter how large your sample size is, no matter how uh, far you have traveled to get that sample, as long as it's pure, water will always have this ratio, which then links back to the idea that water is always gonna have the same chemical formula of H2O. A lot of times it's a lot more effective for us to figure out what um, the percentage by mass of each element is in the compound instead of figuring out a ratio like this. So you might also see instead of ratios like this, we'll make a little box over here of an alternate way, is we might see that if we're um, talking about one, uh, oh gosh, you don't know about moles yet. Um, let's just do uh, two grams of hydrogen and 18 grams of water. So let's say the two grams of hydrogen was the amount of hydrogen in your sample and your entire sample was 18 grams. Then you can multiply this by 100 and get an answer. Then you can do the same thing for your grams of oxygen. For your 18 grams of water which is your sample and you can go through this calculation and you can figure out the percentage of hydrogen in your water and when you do that these should add up really closely to a hundred percent so let's see uh, 18 point or I'm sorry 88 point Eight, eight, let's round that to nine, huh? And this might be a more effective way of illustrating the law of definite proportions is using percentages, which you'll see in problems in the textbook. Let's finish up with law of multiple proportions. Our last law to look at, the law, law of multiple proportions, says that if two elements, oops, form more than one compound then the ratio whoops running into this part there we go um, between the masses of the second element will be small whole numbers. So this one's really hard to wrap your mind around without an example. So let's look at two elements of carbon and oxygen because carbon and oxygen can form CO, carbon monoxide, and CO2, carbon dioxide. So 100 grams of carbon will combine with 133 grams of oxygen to make carbon monoxide. So if we're looking at CO, uh, 133 grams of oxygen per 100 grams of carbon. If we're looking at something like CO2, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get 266 grams of oxygen per 100 grams of carbon. What's important when setting this up is to recognize that your first element's uh, mass is generally gonna stay the same. And what you're taking a ratio of is the mass of the second element. And so what we'll do is we'll say, okay, We've got 100, oops, and 33 grams of oxygen for CO. 
to 266 grams of oxygen for CO2, and that is a one to two ratio. So they're saying this ratio is gonna be a whole number. And then you think, who cares? Obviously that's going to be true. But you know what? If you think about when John Dalton was alive, which I think is the late 1800s, then that's pretty darn impressive, you know, as you're coming up with that whole background idea of atoms, molecules, and elements. Speaking of atoms and um, their, the history of them, let's talk a little bit about what the structure of an atom looks like so that we can move into isotopes soon. So if we look at the structure of a fluorine atom, fluorine I believe is number nine on the periodic table, which I am doing from memory, so I certainly hope that I memorized it correctly. So that means we're going to have nine protons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so I'll draw myself a little key. This is proton. I'm going to change colors and draw some neutrons. Generally, it's pretty safe to say that if you have nine protons, you're going to have an isotope that has nine neutrons. So let's draw in nine neutrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So nine neutrons. So then let's do some electrons. Um, when we're talking about atoms, so not ions, but atoms, remember that they are going to have the same number of protons as they do electrons. Because a proton is positive, an electron is negative, so they'll cancel each other out. So atoms always have a neutral charge. So this in the center here is your nucleus, and then you're going to have a one layer of electrons, and then a second layer, and then a third layer, and then so on, maybe a fourth layer. You learned in high school chemistry that you can have only two electrons in your first layer, that you can have, oh, I'm not going to draw all of them, eight electrons in your second layer, 18 electrons in your third layer, and you probably didn't go much past that. So we'll do this as an electron. So this is our general picture of a fluorine atom where this middle part here, I'll highlight and label as the nucleus. So in general, the nucleus is gonna be really, really small and the electrons are gonna take up a huge amount of space in comparison to that. Keep in mind when you read the history of the atom section that this layout isn't even the case any longer. Right, we, um, this is called the Bohr model of the atom where you see these concentric circles, but when we get to electron configurations and quantum numbers later on, we'll start to see um, the more realistic way and the current theory behind how electrons are situated within an atom. So that's all for this video. As always, thank you for your attention. This is Katoni signing out.